All right, I was born in UCLA Medical Center. I grew up primarily in the San Fernando Valley. All throughout, um, my mom and dad both were in the throes of heroin addiction, so uh, we moved all over the place. Uh, it was really unstable. Um, we generally migrated to like wherever the drugs were. And at this time, I, I, to this day, I don't know if I was naive or they were just good at hiding it, but I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, you know, I recall as a child, like playing go fish and seeing the guy who I'm playing with, like nodding out in front of me. I remember knowing something was off with my mom. Um, my dad was very rarely around, but I didn't know it was the drugs. So I began to develop like this sense of, of like less than, you know, uh, all I knew as a child was like, my mom was not showing up for me. Um, she's out in the streets, she's chasing drugs, she's doing what she has to do to maintain it. And I had no sense of what addiction was at the time. So I took everything like extremely personal. My dad's not here, my mom's around. So I, I, I started feeling worthless and I started to develop these feelings of, of less than, I'm not enough. If your own mother and father don't want you, like fuck, there's something like seriously wrong with you. You're, you're defected some way. And, and I began like nurturing these feelings. I would spend a lot of time alone mostly through music. Uh, that was like my only outlet at the time that made me feel good was music and I used to play basketball. And I, like throughout the majority of my childhood, I nurtured these feelings of your mom and dad don't want you, then, then, then you're worthless, there's something wrong. I was going primarily to private school. At nine, at nine years old, um, I don't remember the situation. I know it involved drug use, prison, mom and them getting arrested, but my grandparents picked me up and they adopted me. They ultimately, the, the process took about a year, but my grandparents took me in at eight years old. My mom could no longer raise me in any kind of capacity anymore. Um, and I remember like going through the adoption process with my grandparents, you know, lawyers and judges and social workers. And I remember thinking in my head, like none of my friends at school have to go through this just to have somewhere to live. So I, I, again, like on top of these like terrible feelings that I was already nurturing, now I'm developing like a resentment for like society because I don't feel a part of it. And I'm starting to hate like everybody for that. So I'm, I'm like, I'm acting out in class. Like I start to steal things. Um, and I remember like one specific day, I don't remember the context of the conversation. I'm sitting down in the hallway. It's between my room and the bathroom. And my grandfather's on the phone. He's on the phone with a social worker. And I remember him using the phrase, we have to take him. Brian doesn't have anybody else. And I get goosebumps just thinking about that today. I, that was the moment the world lost me. I remember in that moment thinking, okay, now you guys are only taking me because you have to. This is what I'm telling you. This is not the reality. This is what I'm saying inside of my head. So my mom doesn't want me. My dad's not even around enough. He doesn't care about me. My grandparents are only taking me in. So at this point, I'm nine, 10 years old. I'm a kid that's dying for acceptance. I'm a kid that's dying for love. I'm a kid that's dying for attention. So I start seeking it out. And my grandparents live in the suburbs in the San Fernando Valley. And a nice neighborhood, they're sending me to a nice school. So externally, everything's great. Everything looks good, but inside, like I'm dying inside. I fucking hate Brian James. I wanna be anything other than Brian James. I can't stand him, because Brian James is a piece of shit. His own mom don't want him, his own dad don't want him. His grandparents have to take him. I heard that phone call. This is, this is the narrative that I'm, like, I'm telling myself. So I go looking for that stuff, and I'm listening. This is the age of, like, this is 88, 87. Uh, you know, NWA is coming out, like gangster rap's coming in, you know, Colors is on TV, and I become fascinated with these shows. And I'm watching them and what fascinated me was like the sense of brotherhood. Like they called each other family in the music. And, and you know, there's the jewelry and the money, which was like super intriguing to me. But I, I, I was looking for the family thing and the love. These are the, thing, these are the needs that I had at the time. And I thought gangs was the answer to all that. I thought that was the answer to all my problems. So I started sneaking out at night and riding my bike to the other side of Sepulveda where um, you know, more of like gang neighborhoods and, and, and those type of areas and spending time um, just hanging around like in that culture, like studying, observing and getting that attention that, that I was dying for. And, and immediately, almost around the same time, the drugs came. 
and I was always scared of drugs because I, I, I knew they played a role in my family. Like heroin had consumed my family tree at that point. So I was scared of them. But, you know, in my mind, you know, I'm telling myself, like, I need these to function. The first time was the drink. You know, I, I, I drank, I, I pounded a 40. That was the day. And I woke up the next morning covered in throw up, covered in vomit, sick with one thought in my head. That made me feel so good. I need more of that. I need more of that. And I think I drank for like the next three weeks. Then I met marijuana, smoked marijuana, smoked that every single day nonstop till I met meth. Like it was just one thing after the next. By this point, um, I'm 16 years old. I'm using meth every day. I'm using alcohol. Like people will say, hey, Brian, what was your drug of choice? My drug of choice was more. That's what I tell them. Uh, I'll pretty much do more of whatever will disconnect me from how I'm feeling because I want to live in this fantasy world of, you know, these are my homeboys and my homegirls and they're going to die for me. Um, and everything I did for them, you know, we call it putting it in work, whether it be a shooting, whether it be jumping somebody, whether it be stabbing somebody, you get this amazing pat on the back that says, that's right, homeboy, good job. And I fucking lived for that. I lived for that. That soothed and filled every need I had. I believed that was the love. Like I believed I had found the love that I was looking for. So the drugs quieted my fears, the drugs that, I, and externally, um, the gang life, it, it, it fulfilled every need that I had. It was, um, I was almost 17. This is at the height of my addiction uh, when I'm on the streets. Um, I'm not going home. I'm up for nine days at a time. I'll sleep two days, go again. Um, my whole life was fully committed to the gang. Um, I wasn't going home to my grandparents' house. I hadn't seen my mom in some time. She's going through her struggles as well. Um, we went to a party. The reason we went to this party is to celebrate my release from juvenile hall. I got out of juvenile hall two days early and we go to this party. So I go to the party and, you know, they want to search us to go into the back of the party. And immediately the gang bravado, the whole image and uh, you're not going to tell me, you're not, you guys ain't searching us. Like we're walking through. And granted, you know, we had weapons on us too that we didn't want to get caught. So we're already, you know, going in in full, you know, gang mind state. I'm a bad dude. Still, this is all things that I'm telling myself inside my head. We walk through and an altercation um, occurs shortly after, about 10 minutes after inside the party with, um, with, a, with an opposing gang. And it was a little scuffle, maybe a couple punches through it and it quickly got separated. So I remember thinking like, damn, like, I, like I'm literally out two days, you know, like I'm down for all this, but this is a little early. Like I, I just got out. So I remember saying, let's leave. So we left and we're jumping in the car. We're caravan and there's probably about five, six car loads at the time, maybe, maybe about 20 of us. And there were probably about 30 of them in there. So as we're driving away, I'm literally in the back seat, we're turning the corner and we see a huge fight break out. And it's second nature for me at this point. Like, um, th there's no thought. I reached under the seat where I was at, I grabbed the knife and I ran to the scene of the fight well, where it was happening. It, it, it was just, it is a backyard party in the 90s. There's chaos everywhere. There's people fighting. I remember seeing a guy punching my friend. He's on top of him. I ran behind him. Uh, I'm slightly intoxicated at this time. And I remember with my left hand, I'm left-handed. I just swung like a roundhouse with a knife as hard as I, as I possibly could. And it hit this man um, under his left armpit. As I sit here now, I can still remember the sound. You know, there, there's like a, like a release of wind, you know. And... Um, as soon as I did it, I ran. I turned around and ran. Um, as I left, um, I guess another one of my homeboys or two or more went in and stabbed him a couple times as well. The next morning, I didn't know what happened. You know, I, I remember I went to my girlfriend's that night. I had blood on my shoes. Um, you know, I took the knife, I threw it in the backyard. I took my shoes, I threw them in a the trash can, all my clothes, I changed my clothes, not knowing what happened. And I went to church, it was Sunday. I went to church with my grandparents that day. And I remember looking in the Metro paper, like, did somebody die? I, you know, I called my friend on the phone, he wasn't home, so 
I, I didn't know what happened. So we're driving home from church uh, with my grandparents. And as soon as we turn the corner to my grandparents' street, I see Channel 7, I see Channel 11, a, a, a bunch of like news channels. And then the whole row is, the whole street's lined with cops. I go, damn. I go, drive, pop. That's what I used to tell my grandpa. He says, man, I can't, Brian. Like, they're all looking at us. So uh, we pulled into the driveway. Uh, I'm surrounded in my driveway by 20 cops. They do a felony arrest on me, and um, they take me to, I'm a juvenile, so they take me to Foothill Police Station in the San Fernando Valley. Put me in there. Um, I had been in and out of juvenile hall my whole life, so I kind of knew the process. They're going to come in and and threaten me and make me sit for a while. But as soon as they came in, um, they says, you're done. This time you're done. You're going Folsom, San Quentin. This is where we're gonna spend the rest of your life. That dude died last night and everybody told on you. And I can't really identify a feeling at that moment. I just remember stealing myself for, okay, this is the moment where you be a, a good gang member you hold your mud, you keep your mouth shut, and you don't say shit to them. So they came in, and I said, I wasn't there. I wasn't at the party. I didn't do it. And at this time, I'm feeling no remorse. I'm full-blown. I'm entrenched in my addiction. Uh, I believe as a gang member, like, this is my duty. Uh, I'm not part of regular society. I'm from this subculture. My allegiance is to my gang. The, drug, the drugs that I've been doing, like, constantly for, like, the last year have totally numbed, like, any feelings I have. Uh, like, they used the word monster in court, and, and I would say that's accurate description of who I was at the time. So they saw that, uh, that I'm not saying anything. So their attempt to break me, the officers handcuffed me. They walked me around a corner, my grandparents, just outside of a wall where they couldn't see me. And they go, listen. And they went and told my, my grandparents were right there. They said, um, he's not going home today. He, he's getting charged with murder. And my grandparents broke down. And that was their goal to attempt to try to break my spirit to, to begin talking. But as I said, man, I was so numb. And at, at the time, like nothing was untouchable in my core. It, it was just, a, it was, I was ugly inside. It was dark and it was cold. So I went to juvenile hall. Um, I went through the court system. They would not allow me to plead guilty. When I went into juvenile hall to my arraignment, the judge said, how do you plead? I said, guilty. Because if I'm guilty as a juvenile, I get out when I'm 25. If they try me as an adult, I die in prison. I never get out. If convicted of the crime. And they charged me with second degree murder and assault with great bodily injury. The judge would not allow me to plead guilty. They said, no, you can't plead guilty. You have uh, a fitness hearing to see whether or not we're going to try you as an adult. How do you plead? I said, guilty. And they got mad at me. I, ultimately, I was not allowed to plead guilty. I went to court the next day. They tried me as an adult. So now I'm going to adult court. And I was facing, uh, the sentence was 50 to life, which whether it's one to life, two to life, if there's a letter, that letter L at the end of your sentence, uh, in the 90s, you're dying in prison. There, nobody's going home at that time. So I went to, um, I started going to adult court. Um, it took about a year and a half. I ultimately went to trial. Trial took a week and a half. Um, the crime happened in a house party, so the witnesses were lining up around the street. Um, I went for a, a self-defense. And during the trial, I remember seeing the guy's girlfriend get up on the stand and just talk about like the pain and the suffering that, that the family was going through. Um, I learned about this man this man, he was a good man. If I had known him in another circumstances, uh, we, I think we could have been best friends. I, I, this is something that I figured out years later at the time. It, it's disgusting for me to say this, but I was proud of what I had done. You commit a murder for a gang, that's the ultimate pledge of allegiance. Like, you're that guy now. You know, I, I immediately became that guy because I told him, like, I, I, I told you I'm all in on this right here. So I, I was really cold. It, it wasn't until years later that I read the transcripts of, of my trial that, uh, that, that I came to understand these things, but they ultimately found me guilty of, of second degree murder and they gave me 15 to life for that. And the assault with great bodily injury, 
um, four years for that, and I got one year for the knife. So I ended up with 20 years to life. And I was 17 years old at that time. I went back to the county jail that night and um, again, like as insane as it sounds, even to me right now, there was like such a sense of pride. Like I just took a life sentence for my gang. And, you know, I remember I, I had got a couple of tattoos in there at the time they were doing in the county jail it was the pick tattoos. Hook up like a staple and they'd make the ink. And, you know, I, I, I had got a 13 behind my ear and the SFE back here. But inside, this is the truth. As I, I, you know, I'm walking around and people are like, damn, this, this dude is with the business. This is dad. The truth of the fact is inside, I was nothing but a scared ass little punk kid who just wanted to be fucking loved who would have done anything for love. I would have sat and spun if you would have patted me on the back and say, good job. This is what I've learned in, in the latter years of my life. You know, as I sat for, I did 29 years in prison. As I sat for about 26 of those asking myself, 25 of those asking myself, why the fuck am I doing what I keep doing? And the majority of my time was spent Inside, I, most of my time was in a level four maximum security. So the bulk of my life was spent in a box with, with nothing to do but think and, and, and try to understand myself. The first 20 of those years were spent using drugs. Um, I did heroin my first year in prison. There was a riot that took place. Um, I got caught slipping during that riot and I was stabbed 27 times. This is probably about my eighth month in prison. And that put a fear in me and an anxiety in me that um, I could only have coped with through heroin. This is what I told myself. You know, I went and got some heroin and, and I did it. And immediately when I did it, it's like all my problems were like bagged up and just thrown out the window. I wasn't a lifer. Uh, you know, I wasn't the, the piece of shit kid whose mom and dad didn't want him, whose grandparents had to take him. You know, it, it, it like bolsters this pride of the, you're in prison for murder. Like I really thought like I, like, like I was a good dude, like doing some good things. Like I was an honorable person, you know? And um, that's what the heroin did for me. And I, and, and I remember that night thinking, fuck, I found the answer to all my problems. I can do this life sentence with this heroin. And it, it was great for about the next two times until it turned on me. Then my attitude is changing. I don't feel good about myself. I use it and now I'm wallowing in self-pity. And now I need it, you know, and, and I end up getting, getting strung out on it. I used it every day for six months and I tried to stop in the, the pain of the withdrawals because drugs are, are plentiful in prison, yeah. you know, anything you're looking for just like these streets out here, you'll find it if, if you have the money. And I ended up getting strung out on heroin and I went in that circle of, of going on these three, four month runs, going on lockdown, going through the withdrawal of like two weeks. I, I went in that circle probably damn near for about 19 years while involved in, in the politics of the yard and involved in you know trying to make a name for myself. And the things that I did, when I came to prison, the same issues that plagued me, that led to my incarceration, like I hadn't addressed none of that stuff. So prison, it, it didn't do anything for me. All it did was introduce me to more elite gang members and more sophisticated criminals. And for a kid dying to learn and, and, and level up in that world, like I, I couldn't have asked for a better place. Too, I, you know, I spent all my time in the yard just watching, observing, thinking I'm learning things and I'm growing, which today, I have come to understand, especially in the moments where I'm alone, where I'm quiet, those traumas come back to haunt you later in life. Like I, I, I still can visualize things that I've seen, um, circumstances that I've been in, people that I've met, like the boogeyman is real. Like I met some of the hardest, toughest, strongest, most intellectual men probably in California. You know, scary people. So I, I, I spent my life on those yards and ultimately, I was put away in a security housing unit. It's called the SHU. I did um, some time in Pelican Bay SHU, and I did some time in Corcoran SHU. I did eight years in Corcoran SHU the last time. And which basically, 
they take you off the main line because they say you have an influence over other inmates. Like if you're being a good gang member and doing what you're supposed to do, that's where you end up. Um, and it was in there during that time, it was in 2011, I went out to a visit. It's a one hour visit, it's behind glass back there. It's a rough life. And my mom came, it was supposed to be my mom and my grandma. My grandma used to come every weekend. My mom would come every weekend and I, I, I tell my mom, hey, where's Nan at? And I remember my mom, again, I, I, I can see it perfect. Like there, there was a flinch on her face and she started crying and she told me that my grandmother died and this was unexpected. My grandmother is Sheila, Sheila Mary James. She's, she's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Um, I wasn't ready for that. You know, I wasn't ready for that. And I dropped, I hit the floor. I hit the floor right there. I, like I didn't know what to do. And 45 minutes later, after telling me, James, Brian, visit's over, backed up, handcuffed, and they just put me back in the cell. What I went through in, in, the, in the following 30 days alone inside that cell, because I was single cell, like I, 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 can't, I can't even put words to it. Like I suffered immensely so bad, but like even my teardrops were like bigger. Like I cried almost for like two weeks straight. And I remember it was probably about the first week when, okay, when, my, when I found out this was New Year's Eve and, and I'll never forget that night, I don't like, telling this story, but um, you know, I, I think it's important. I'm sitting in front of the TV on New Year's Eve. I just found out that my grandmother had died. And I'll never forget, it's 1136 because it was Ryan Seacrest and Nicki Minaj were on the TV when I told myself, I'm gonna fucking kill myself right now. I, I can't do it. I can't do it without my grandma. And in the show, a lot of people kill themselves. They hang themselves um, from vents or, or they, they take drugs to overdose because um, it, it's one of the CDCR uh, weapons in their belt uh, to torture was to lock people inside there and never let them out. And I remember thinking, uh, like, I got to go. I got to do this. I'm looking at my body. I'm covered in tattoos. I have scars from the damage done from needles. And inside my mind, I'm still running this same narrative of this piece of shit kid who, who nobody wants him, like, that, that I've constantly told myself this over the years. And I remember I closed my eyes, you know, I was raised, my grandparents raised me in a Christian home. So suicide was like, you, you're gonna end up going to hell. You're not gonna go to heaven. So I remember saying a prayer, like making a deal with God. Like, let me get this last one. You know, I, I gotta go with, with Nana. And I closed my eyes and I, you know, I didn't have an epiphany. There were no bright lights, nothing major happened, but when I, opened my eyes, I decided to put my death off for a couple of days. I was going to kill myself a couple of days later. And in the space of those couple of days, I came up with this idea that I'm going to try to figure out how to change myself because this shit ain't working no more. By this point, I'm 30 years in the game. I've been arrested. You know, I, I, I've been out for 200 days now. I, I filled out like, I did a, um, like a mock job application and where it said felonies, you know, I wrote all of them. And I literally have like, you name it, armed robbery, all the way up throughout juvenile, all the way up to and including the murder charges. And I just was not happy anymore. And it was either die or become somebody new. Now, once you have a desire to change as I did, you need the tools to do it. There's nobody around me. Everybody around me is as fucked up, if not more fucked up than, than I was. By that point, my mom had gotten clean. She had some clean time and, and she sent me the big blue book of NA and I just started reading through it. And I was like, holy shit, like this is my biography. Like these people know me, like they're literally telling my story. It started there. Um, you know, I tell people too, it's a funny story. I didn't know how to act civilized. I know how to function perfectly in a gang culture, but in a civilized, I used to watch Grey's Anatomy to see how they dealt with life problems and try, maybe try to like imitate. Um, but I was starving for something different. I changed the music I listened to. I changed the shows I listened to. And it was about a four year process for me to evolve into someone that I can look in the mirror and be like half ass proud of myself. I got my GED in there. And this is in CDCR um, 
California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, um, they push back against change. It's, it's, it's not in their best interest for, for prisons to empty out. So I had to fight to actually get therapy and get self-help groups to start answering these questions that, that, that I needed. Why did I become this gang member? Like, why, why do I need drugs to feel good? Like, why, can't, why am I having conflict with every person around me everywhere I go? Like, I was dying for these. And the moment came when I'm walking back in and at, at this point, finally I'm out of the shoe. We had a, the 30,000 people took part in a hunger strike in California um, in protest of the shoe conditions, which um, allowed us, me being one of the inmates to get out of the shoe and back into the general population where you have access to programming in school. So I'm out back in the general population and I'm open to new experiences. Hope I'm trying to learn things. And I walked in and I saw positive change dog program sign up on the wall. And I'm thinking, we're in Corcoran level four. Like this is probably the most treacherous yard in California at this time. Like they're not gonna let no fucking dogs onto this yard. But I'm open to things now. Like uh, I'm trying to be a different person and think different. I signed my name. I'll be damned if a month later, this man walks onto the yard with a pit bull. And Zach Scow, who's one of my great mentors and friends today. And I pet my, the first dog that I've touched in like 25 years. I got down and, and, and I ran my hand across his fur back and forth. And I can only describe that like as a spiritual experience for me at this point. After, you know, so many years in there just to have an animal like with that compassion. And he said, the program's coming next month and you're in. So the following month, uh, they got together, the 20 of us that were in the program, they brought seven dogs. They, they intentionally pair you with someone who's like virtually your opposite. I got paired with a, a guy from Compton, um, an active gang member from, from Piru, from Ludus Park Piru, probably about eight years my junior. They said, you, Brian and Didante, you guys are partners and, and you're gonna raise this dog together. Now, I had seen this guy around, but we never talked. You know, he, he, he was a soldier for what he represented and I was a soldier for what I represented. And the only reason for us to talk is like some kind of political to settle something, to deal with something. Other than that, it was just like a, a, like a pure cold respect. So I had seen him around. So we started training this dog and he'd say, hey, I gotta go to school in the afternoon. You mind watching him in the morning? I said, yeah, I got kitchen. I work in the kitchen in the afternoon, you got him then. So we'd start working together and we start talking about our families and like, while raising this dog and, and making connections. So to bring it all together with, with, with that program, this guy who was my virtual opposite, who we should have never been friends, became my best friend. He's my best friend today. He paroled a year earlier than me and we, we spend time together, we work together. And I had, a, I had a moment during that dog program. As I was, I used to get up every morning, I would run five laps with my dog. The love, the acceptance, the belonging, everything that I had been searching for my entire life in gangs and drugs and the streets and all kind of destructive behavior, this dog gave it all to me. I, I, I get a sense of belonging when, when the pack of dogs accept me as them. Every day, my dog's sitting there, eyes up, looking at me, tail wagging. What are we going to do today? It's, it's a love that I've been searching for my entire life. It, it fundamentally changed me, who I am as a person being involved in that dog program. And not only did I learn a work ethic, um, you, you gain a sense of compassion and empathy when you're working with another animal. And this transfers on to my other relationships with people, my day-to-day -day relationships with my family. So every area of my life improved. I got clean and sober. The last time I put a needle inside my arm was August 10th, 2016. That was the last time I ever used drugs. The dog program came two years later. I had another opportunity because um, of good behavior in prison. And I had 35 rule violations, what they call 115 write-ups. Um, you know, I, I had court cases, 
But as I said, after my grandma's death, something, something changed. So I had an opportunity to go to a level three, which was a lower level. This place had college, um, so many self-help groups. I spent three years there fully immersed in, in trying to understand who I am, why I did what I did. Um, I developed a, a sense of empathy and remorse for my crime. Today, my victim of my crime, like I understand he, he was entirely undeserving of that. Like he did nothing to deserve that. It was all me, 100% me. That bullshit story I used to tell myself where he knew what he signed up for. If, if it, the roles reversed, I'd been in the grave and he'd be, that's a bunch of bullshit right there. That's bullshit, you know? That's that fake fucking story that us as gang members tell ourselves that we're putting it in work. It's not putting in work, you're taking the life of a human being. You're not putting in work, like you're, you're beating up somebody's son. You know, you're hurting somebody's daughter. You can fancy it up in, in whatever kind of language you want. And I get it, I, I, don't, I don't judge anybody. I did it because you have to survive. You have to tell your mind something. But I've evolved past that thinking. And I remember, I would like to share a moment. I, I did a, it's called Healing and Dialogue. Three mothers came in. All three of their sons had been murdered by gang violence. And I sat across from these women and they told me their experience, what they went through. I, I could never possibly be the same person again after hearing that. And I told them mine and, I and, they, and they go, what's the hardest part for you in dealing with that? And I said, it's forgiving myself. Like I managed to separate myself from gangs. I managed to get clean and sober, but the fact remains like I, I, a mother had to close a casket on her son because of me that's always there in the back of my head. Like, how can I forgive myself? These three women stood up right there with tears in their eyes and said, we forgive you. They circled me, they wrapped their arms around me and they hugged me. And we fucking sobbed together for like a half hour right there. My life was never the same. I, I, I made a commitment that night that under no circumstances would I ever use violence again to solve my problems. Um, and I was going to do everything I can to honor the life that I took because for better or worse, our stories are forever intertwined. Um, I, you know, I, I exploded in his world and I took his life from him. So I owe him that. Um, I think about him every single day. He's, he's what drives me every single day to do the work that I do in the community and at work and mentoring youth. Beautiful story. Thank you.